Uh, so welcome to the show, uh, New Zealand journalist uh, Tom Much. Tom is in Lviv, in Ukraine, uh, where we spoke to you the other day on Monday, our time, uh, Tom, as well. So you were in a backpack as you were in that area. Is that still where you're uh, located from day to day? You're in the same building, same location? Uh, we moved to a uh, we moved apartment, but yeah, got a hotel room now. But so slightly nicer, but yeah, still basically the same sort of stuff. And most of the hostels and hotels here are, have actually changed to double as uh, refugee uh, kind of camps. You know, all the people that have been fleeing from eastern Ukraine, whether it's Donbass, whether it's Kiev, whether it's Kharkiv, most of them stay here now. You talked about on Monday of potentially heading back east, obviously, if it was safe enough to go to report. But I also I, I'm pretty sure I saw this morning because I thought of you uh, when I saw um, the city you're in talking about some low flying jets seen overhead. Is, yep. is that correct? Have you seen that? And is that the Russian forces moving further west? So I it's not. I know what it is and i unfortunately because of like operational security reasons i can't really go into too much okay. detail but they were ukrainian and okay. there were a lot of them all right well that i mean that's good to know because all i we saw was a headline about low flying jet so that means that's a it's your you're safer than if it was russian yeah, exactly exactly migs um what are you seeing what have you seen over the last couple of days i know you've been out um you know being a journalist and looking around and getting information what can you update us on uh, the last 48 72 hours okay so from over here what i've been mainly doing now is i've been mainly focusing on the refugee crisis on the border as i said this is one of the biggest refugee crises any country in europe has had for about you know in the last, since the second world war it threatens you know people think there could be you know up to five million refugees end up fleeing ukraine possibly even more and so there have been these huge big long lines on the border we're talking about or lines that go for like you know something that we're going for like 30 40 kilometers at one point you know, I know people who walked you know, for literally 15, 16 hours in a row to try and get to the front. And then when they, once they got to the border, some of them were stuck there. We're talking like two, three days, wow. absolutely freezing cold. You know, it's snowing at the moment. It was just really, really horrible scenes there. Hey, Tom, we um, we were talking the other day about reports of of some refugees not being allowed into Poland, especially Ukrainians of African descent, or, uh, you know, there are reports of Indian students not being allowed on trains and, and this sort of thing. Is, is this something you can confirm or at least talk to? Uh, I can confirm that definitely was the case at some point. I, I remember I, spoke, I had one particularly bad story. I spoke to a, a guy from Morocco. He said that one of his friends had been turned back and actually some of the border guards had beaten him and they'd sent him to the back of the queue. So for a long time, they had a rule that was basically uh, women and children only and the men, you know, whether they were Ukrainian or foreigners, uh, with the exception of like European foreigners, uh, were not or uh, Americans or you know Western foreigners were not allowed to cross, and so you know there were guys. We, we met guys from Congo. We met guys from uh, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, uh, Rwanda. People who'd been there, like you know, they were the ones who were really stuck there. Some of them were burning their clothes to keep warm. They had no proper shelter. They had no proper um, food stuff, food supplies. So we bought them a bunch of food and blankets and stuff. However, I went back to that same border today, and it did think, seem like things had stabilised a little bit. You know, uh, the lines were much, much lesser. Uh, the place where they were camping out that had been cleared, and apparently most of them had been let across the border. But we do hear there are other problems on borders, such as Romania and Hungary as well. Which um, which what sorry, Pat, which, which border, um, Tom, have you been? Is it the Polish border or the Moldova? Oh, yeah. So it's, it's the Polish border. The majority, I think, probably about fifty percent of, of refugees have taken the the route into Poland. You know, the others. Are... Hello, hello, hello. I'm here. I'm okay. Here. Sure. I mean, look. I mean, you're in a war zone. I mean, if the if the internet kind of cuts out a bit, where we're we're okay with that. I wanted to know as well, Tom. Um, obviously, all the rest of the world are seeing headlines, and they're probably seeing the one percent of the best stories. You know, the vitriolic, this is what the uh, what's happening in Ukraine. And they're probably saying 1% of the worst stories for what's happening with the impact and the buildings falling and the death. If you were to help us understand maybe more from on the ground what is happening, well, like what, what don't we know 
that needs to be known that maybe is not in the media the world over right now? So, look, one thing that I've been trying to get um, get a little bit of attention to, and this is quite a sad scenario, is a lot of people have heard about, you know, the sort of the, mil- the great military heroics. But what not a lot of people have heard about is what's happened with civilians. Now, unfortunately, and I have to be honest here, the Ukrainian authorities have really dropped the ball. They're uh, in Kiev, for instance, supermarkets are starting to run out of supplies. You know, you, you can't really drive. A lot of people can't drive out of Kiev because there's huge shortages of fuel. For whatever reason, the Ukrainian government had like months and months and months to prepare for a possible invasion. There's no food stockpiles. There's no blanket stockpiles. There's no water stockpiles. None of the stuff has been stockpiled. Now they're trying to desperately get, you know, supplies into Kiev via trains and, and, and buses and stuff. It's really not going well. And this is one of the things that I think is, is one of the biggest problems is, you know, a lot of civilians probably they're not going to be, you know, the are very, very unlucky ones. And it's very, very tragic going to be killed by Russian artillery or rockets or, or airstrikes. But there are a lot of people who are literally just in there, holed up in their apartments, holed up in bomb shelters, just just starving effectively. You know, when I was when I, I spent a couple of I spent three nights in a bunker in, in Kiev in a bomb shelter in a metro station, and you know, no one down there had any supplies other than what they'd carried down there. And those right. supplies are really, really running running low. Um, with that, is there anything that like the rest of the world can do? I mean, is there ways that is like the Red Cross working in the area at the moment? Can we get in, or is that not possible in an active war zone? So, I mean, the Red Cross work in pretty much everywhere that isn't, you know, uh, you know, they work a, a lot of places. But we haven't seen a very big NGO presence, to be honest. Like, we've seen a couple of Red Cross tents. Um, I haven't seen. I haven't seen it. Uh, to my knowledge, I can't even remember seeing any like United Nations um, buildings or workers or anything like that. So yeah, there's a small Red Cross presence. Um, there are a couple of like Ukrainian NGOs who are doing very very good work here. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name is is Caritas or something. Is Caritas? I'm pretty sure. There's a Ukrainian NGO that they've been providing you know food and shelter and uh, to refugees. But honestly. A lot of it's been done by like local volunteers on the ground and stuff. Right. We're not seeing a very coordinated effort. Um, I was wondering as well, um, there is some criticism of the Western media right now, um, kind of going, oh my goodness, all these people are in the war. There's a war going on. All these people are being impacted by the war. And some of the criticism is, yeah, this has been happening every single day of our lives for the last hundred years. But there seems to be a, a group of, a, a group within the media or certainly a commentary within the media that is there's even been things said like they look like me i never thought this would happen they've got blonde hairs and blue eyes um is there any feeling of that in the ukraine is within ukraine are people seeing the response by the western media and what are they thinking of it because i'm saying some are saying basically that there is a racist response because they've ignored all the brown wars and they're very surprised that there's a war happening in a part of the world that they recognize Okay, so that, that's a very, very interesting question, a good point, and it takes a while to to unpack. So cool. First, for the Ukrainian response, look, the Ukrainians are not thinking about anything outside of Ukraine at the moment or, or, or where they can get to safety. They're entirely concentrated on fighting, you know, what for them is effectively an existential war. Um, yeah, it's true that there is a lot of carnage that has happened in a lot of the world, and honestly, I do think there are people who who see Ukraine and they think, oh, they look like us, therefore they're more important and they haven't cared about about wars that have gone on in, in other parts of the world. And that is very, very shocking and very, very sad. There's also another couple of other factors, one of which is that, yes, for instance, you know, in Syria you had a civil war, you had a rebel against the government, I and mean, yes, it was very brutal. But this is a state-on-state war. State-on-state wars are a, a much, much, much higher level of destruction per per day or per capita just because you have the entire both sides have the entire power of state arsenals so the images are much more shocking there's a lot you know the, the weapons used are like overwhelmingly more destructive and it's these kind of uh you know there has been no war where we've seen dog fights literal dog fights over kiev in the way that you know that, that hasn't really happened since the second world war that said yes for instance like how many people know that you know recently saudi arabia carried out a massive bombing raid on on yemen like very basically no one it's been it's been ignored 
part of it also is access. It's harder to get access to some of these places than it is to Ukraine, which most journalists can enter for free. There are a lot of reasons, and, and some of them are very... Uh, 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 some of them are valid. Some of them just come down to sort of the nature of the conflict and the nature of the access that we have. Yeah, it's an interesting thing because we're trying. I, I'm trying to be sort of uh, generous by going. Maybe this is the wake up call for some people who have ignored all that in the past. But equally, going, hey guys, you know, there's. I mean, we've got Mukti Az- Azamandi coming on tomorrow, who's a, who's got a doctorate in racism, basically. Um, and I want to say, you know, you've got people saying. I mean, these people were living in these cities their whole lives, and now their cities have been bombed about the Ukraine. But I kind of want to go, ah, Baghdad, you know, uh, Senegal, you know, these places that are, it's exactly the same scenario that they've lived in those cities all their lives, and there's war going on, but they haven't quite acknowledged it. So I want to give them credit for saying, well, on good on you for coming on board now, but also go, but you do realize this has been happening for every day of our lives forever. These wars have been going on around the world. But look, um, I know that George has got a question before we let you go, Tom. Yeah. So go to George. Tom, yesterday we were talk, talking about um, uh, paramilitaries in Ukraine, part of Ukrainian military and also part of the Russian military. And you, as someone who's been in the Ukraine, what Ukraine since uh, you know before this latest um, conflict, what what is what? Maybe you can confirm for us, like the place that a group like as the Azov Battalion have in the Ukrainian military and indeed Ukrainian uh, politics? Right. Uh, yeah. So this is, an, again, a question that takes quite a long time to unpack. So what you really, t- t- to understand, so obviously the Azov Battalion, for people who aren't aware, is basically this battalion that's got, uh, you know, it's, it's a paramilitary organisation and it's it's renowned for having a lot of, of a lot of commanders who had quite strong far-right links. You know, some of them were, you know, there was a, a small handful that were like avowed neo-Nazis and, you know, they were, they were pretty, pretty brutal people. I, I've met a number of them and most of them just act like, you know, normal former soldiers. But so here's the thing is that when the war broke, first broke out in 2014, the smaller war, um, you know, with, over Donbass and, and over Crimea, the Ukrainian army was in a complete state of disrepair. You know, it had barely any, it could, it could, I think, about 10,000 service people under arms that it could pull together if it really could. Uh, if it really needed to. And if, for that reason, it was basically just getting smashed up. So it had to turn to a lot of these kind of paramilitary organizations, had to sort of hold, you know, everyone had to hold their nose and allow them to do the fighting because actually they were quite well trained, had quite good weaponry and quite good equipment. Now, that said, the Ukrainian army has developed significantly since then. It's kind of brought a lot of these paramilitary organizations under their uh, you know, under its kind of radar, but it's stripped the, the the kind of the radical, the far right elements out of them. Should also remember that you know this is a you know, for sure. There's 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 crazy far right people here. There's crazy far right people in every country. This is a country that elected a Jewish president with nearly seventy five percent of the vote, right? And you know the num and yes, that they did play a role in the first war. That can't be denied. But this is, I would say, their role in this war is no real different to all, to the vast majority of the Ukrainian population that's taking up arms, that's joining volunteer militias. There really isn't much of a kind of a radical element. I think that's that bigger force in Ukrainian society and politics anymore. Hey, Tom, obviously the two biggest stories in the world at the moment is Ukraine and on a second level at the moment is what's happening with COVID. I just actually thought yesterday, what if these two things have mixed? I mean, COVID, especially what's happening at the moment with Omicron is incredibly infectious. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees flooding out of out of Ukraine. Have you seen, are you seeing, is there a concern in Ukraine that there's also on top of this now going to be a massive COVID spike? I've got to be honest. No one cares. No okay. one cares <laughs> at all. <laughs> that's, that's, that's as simple as that. No one's mentioned COVID to me at all. Because okay. I mean, like, you know, COVID will know how deadly it can be. The, the Ukrainian people see this as an existential threat, something that could destroy the entire country. And, and yeah, just not, not a consideration. Hey, look, it's, it's been fantastic for you to join us again. Thank you so much. I did wanted to ask, ask you, uh, you still got, I mean, obviously you're a Kiwi, but you've done, uh, as you told us on Monday, kind of like tours of duty, so to speak, in many dangerous regions. Have you got Fano still in New Zealand? And are they, you keep in contact with them? Yeah. How do they feel about where you are and what you're doing right now? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't think my my parents have had to like choose a, a job for me. We we put war correspondent at the very top of their list, but yeah, yeah, I still I talk to them. I, I make sure I keep in touch as much as I can. I mean, no one's sleeping much here, so I've got the time to do it. <laughs> All right, Tom March. Hey, people want to follow you. Twitter's a really good way. Let me just say, I'm I'm addicted to your Twitter. I have um I have I've I've belled you. So literally every time you send out a, t- a tweet, it pops up on the front of my phone. And I just think it's a really good way for people who want to be informed with Ukraine as to how they can be informed with Ukraine. So I uh, thank you for from me. Thank you for the work you're doing there. Stay super super safe, and uh, cheers for joining us again. Cheers. Enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Have a good one.